Hello everyone, Tech Select here. Uh, wait, uh, sorry about that. Still getting the audio dialed in. Hello everyone, Kevin from Tech Select here. It's been a few months since the last X16 update, and I decided to make a quick video here and there as development progresses. I posted a few videos in early January after Adrian was able to help me get past a few hurdles, and since that time I've made a few more tweaks and we've decided on a few more minor changes. If you follow the X16 on the official website or on Facebook, you'll probably know that the Philips SAA 1099 IC was removed from the system. So why did it have to go? Well, let's dive in for a moment. Traditional synthesizers use analog oscillators to generate sound. Analog in this case really just means an AC voltage. These oscillators may also be digitally generated in some cases. Many wave types such as sine, square, or triangle waves may be added together to generate distinct tones. Programmable sound generators, or PSGs like the SAA 1099, are analog or digital synths which allow parameter control through writing values to its registers over a data bus. Other ICs such as the SN76489 and the AY38910 are also PSGs and were used in many early arcade and computer systems like the Sega Master System and the PC Junior. FM synthesis uses analog or digital oscillators and combines them with a frequency modulated signal. The result of these combined signals generates unique and distinctive tones like the Sega Genesis and of course the venerable AdLib card and all of its variants. The last commonly used source of sound is, of course, digital sample playback. PCM or wave data can be pre-sampled and played back directly or in a modified form to make sound effects and music. In the PC world, this first became popular with a sound blaster, but now it's the dominant method for sound playback on both PCs and game consoles alike. So that brings me back to our original design goals and why the SAA 1099 was dropped. While researching vintage systems, most either have a PSG IC, an FM IC, or the ability to playback samples or some combination of the three. Including all three in the X16 would cover most of the sound used by vintage hardware. The SAA 1099 was added before the Vera was complete, and now it's very clear that the Vera can not only replicate what the 1099 can do, it can actually do quite a bit more. In essence, it really just became redundant, and the Vera also plays digital samples back, and with the FM side being covered by the YM2151, it just really wasn't needed any longer. The next change is related to the power on circuitry I'd used on the second prototype. Initially it seemed to work well, although I did need to add one more feature which I had yet to do. ATX power supplies have a line called Power OK. It has two purposes. The first is to tell the system when the power supply is stable after startup. This way you know when to resume normal operation and let the system power on. It is then used to let you know that the power supply is continuing to run correctly. In other words, a short or a failure condition should result in the line being revoked and the system should then immediately power off. I spent a lot of times on breadboards, Ben Eater style, testing various iterations of the circuit and came up with something that I thought worked as I desired. However, as I began to test more power supplies on the second prototype, I found that my debound circuit was not as effective as I had hoped. I went back to the drawing board and this time I really wanted to incorporate the Power OK line in the design. One other factor which has been hugely important from the beginning is cost. The circuit incorporated button debouncing a reset and NMI driver, and now power supply monitoring was needed. I don't know 100% for sure, but I'm guessing that most commercial ATX motherboards use microcontrollers for this purpose. As I kept adding things on, it was starting to become a very large and costly circuit. And after discussing it with the team and performing the necessary level of persuasion, I was able to convince David that this was the right approach for stability. I did still plan to use a dip style through hole IC, and personally, I'm rather partial to Arduinos. After a bit of searching, I settled on the ATtiny84. It's a 14-pin dip IC and it looks right at home on the system. It monitors the buttons, the power OK line, and turns the power supply off and on at the right times. It also drives the reset and the NMI lines to the CPU and controls the power LED as well as the hard drive activity LED. Most ATX cases only have two buttons and two LEDs. I had completely neglected to include a traditional hard drive activity light on the original prototype, so I added on the second with a pin from one of the 6522s. The Vera has no free pins to drive this LED directly, so turning the hard drive light off and on will be software controlled. I decided at the last minute to move this LED over to the microcontroller. But how would you control it, you might ask? Well, more on this in a minute. 
While on my cost cutting mission, I decided that the Dallas DS12885 was just too expensive. When selecting a real time clock, I wanted an IC that worked like vintage systems did and had some NVRAM storage to boot. This way, we could save custom settings and load them on startup if desired. The best and cheapest candidate was the 12885, but it's by no means cheap. I began taking a look at other DIP options, and the MCP7940 IC really stood out. It's an 8 pin DIP IC, but it uses the I2C or two wire interface standard. This does change the way we will interface with this IC, and it does mean that bit banging them from the 6522 would probably be the easiest approach to read and write to the clock. This once again may be a bit of a departure from a vintage system, but it will offer a few nice features. Okay, so now we have an I2C bus to control the real-time clock and a microcontroller to control the power supply. So why not combine the two? Well, you actually can connect multiple devices to a single I2C bus, so you would be able to control not only the clock, but the power IC as well. This is how the hard drive activity light will be accessible through software. It'll also allow you to control reset and power off of the system. More importantly, you'll actually be able to push the NMI button. Not quite as good as a hardware restore key, but still handy. Speaking of buttons, I mentioned that since most ATX cases only have two buttons, it really was a problem because we need three. One for power, one for reset, and one for NMI. However, I was able to make the reset button on a traditional ATX case serve two functions using the microcontroller. Right now, the way I have it set up, a short push will activate NMI, and if you hold the button longer, it'll press reset. Of course, this is all code in an Arduino, so it certainly can be changed, more features could be added, or the behavior of buttons could be modified. I also plan to leave a header on the board so that you can connect an AVR ISP 10-pin programmer and do what you like. As a bonus, the header will also double as an I2C bus. Okay, so what's next? Well, I just finished a prototype with all of these changes baked in, and finally sent it off to Michael Style so he can work on the next build of the kernel. He now has what I hope to be really close to the final hardware. There will be a few more tweaks and changes, but theoretically nothing else that will change the kernel or anyone's code. I'm going to give him a little bit of time before I start the next board layout on what will become the third prototype. I want to make sure that if there are any problems, we find them now before we lay another board out. And while this board is really more of a 2.1 or maybe a 2.5 version, we're just going to go ahead and call it the third. Well, I believe that's all I have for today. I appreciate everyone watching and hope you take care.